Alabama has proposed a new red flag law. And I know that everybody is going to be really baffled by this. And, and goodness knows when I saw it the first time, I was pretty taken aback too. But there is a good reason why this red flag law is very different. And when you have ruby red Alabama, which loves some gun rights, why they would be proposing this and why this at least has a chance of passing. So I'll explain why this is a very different red flag law than the one that we're accustomed to. So it is being sponsored actually by Republicans, which granted the Republicans in Alabama aren't too conservative. So I guess it wouldn't shock people if it were a traditional red flag law that was being put forward. And you also have our Republican president, Donald Trump now coming out in favor of red flag laws, which is, I mean, just wrought with all kinds of difficulties, but I won't get into the national red flag laws. The one I'm talking about specifically is the one that is being proposed here for Alabama, and it specifically has to do with gun suicides. So what this is aimed at doing is not at preventing gun suicides by confiscating the guns of law-abiding Americans. And I have always said I am willing to hear proposals that might actually solve some problems that are targeted not at law-abiding citizens, but at taking guns away from people who don't need them. And by need, I don't mean you have to justify that need. I'm just saying that people that have had some reason to show you they cannot be trusted with their Second Amendment rights, criminals, violent offenders, that kind of thing. Well, this one is specifically trying to prevent suicides by restricting access to gun to certain people, and the ban would last only 21 days. In other words, you get put on a no-buy list, but that no-buy list only lasts for three weeks. Because when somebody's dealing with suicide, they you know, may be able to not get over it in 21 days. I mean, that can take years of therapy. But if somebody is struggling with, with really serious clinical depression or whatever it is, they might need a firearm at some point. And so the period you would have to refresh putting your name on the buy list every 21 days, it's not something that would linger for years and years, which A, is helpful because there are a lot of red flag laws being proposed in more liberal states, and there have been proposals about this at the national level, that once you've either willingly or forcibly been committed to some kind of mental health institution, that you would just lose your right to have a firearm. I remember that back in the Obama administration, one of the things that never came to fruition, but was being talked about within the Obama administration, is that they would like to see legislation that got rid of a person's right to keep and bear arms if they had ever undergone psychological treatment. Well, I mean, psychological treatment, how broad do you want to go with that? And one of the situations that I specifically outlined is let's say that there was a woman that was the victim of sexual assault or rape. You would imagine that such a person had probably gone through some counseling. Would that person then be barred from having a firearm, which they may need to help them feel safer, because they're worried that something like that could happen again? And so you can see why there's all kinds of issues that crop up when you have a third party telling, to some, uh, telling somebody, no, you've had a history of mental illness, and we're going to take away your firearms as a result. Now, if we're talking about somebody that has a long, consistent record of mental illness, and with that has a criminal record of violence, I understand where you're coming from and can kind of get on board with that. But if you use too broad a definition, and this is the reason why you have to be really careful when wading into this territory, you could have a situation like I just described with a woman that's the victim of rape or sexual assault. You could also have soldiers, which are very well trained in firearms, and if anybody should be handling it, it would be them that might have PTSD or have had to go to treatments for that, or maybe even went to treatments even if they didn't have PTSD, but they just needed to talk to somebody about some things. What if you had somebody that had just gone to marriage counseling? I mean, this is the issue that you come into, is that and this is the reason that you generally don't trust Democrats when they talk about their gun measures is because all you have to do is broaden that definition just a little and you will be restricting a constitutional God-given right to millions of Americans. 
Here's the reason I don't think that that's as big an issue with this red flag law, though, that is being proposed in Alabama. The only person, the only person that can submit your name to that no-buy list for that 21-day restriction is you. That's it. Not a family member, not a police officer, you. Now, if you've been shown to be a violent threat to yourself or others, there are certainly other state and national laws that could bar you from having a firearm, but this one specifically only focuses on people that are saying, you know what, I've had suicidal thoughts, I don't even want the temptation of being able to go and buy a gun, I don't, want, I don't trust myself with that, and so because of that, to protect my own life, I will voluntarily put my name on a no-buy list. And because of that, because it is something that it is a self, it is a self-imposed restriction, I have far less issues with the liberty because it requires the consent of the person whose liberties would be restricted to them. I think that you could still, on a technical level, argue that, well, it's an inalienable human right, so not even that person has the ability to remove that right from themselves certainly have the right to not exercise it if they choose not to, in the same way that a person, just because they have a thought in their head, doesn't mean that they have to engage in free speech. They're allowed to keep it to themselves and not exercise it if they want to. But it's a whole different ball of wax for that person to forcibly say, no, no, take that right from me. So I don't see as many issues. I think if you want to get really technical and really philosophical, you might could make that point, but I just don't see nearly as many issues with the person's freedom when they're the ones doing it to themselves. But I will say this. I've known a few people that struggle with really bad depression, and I think that it's perfectly reasonable and healthy that they don't trust themselves with certain abilities, with certain... It, for example, in this with the guns, that they don't necessarily trust themselves around firearms. That's a healthy attitude to have, that they're saying, I don't even want to tempt myself, so I don't need to be around things that I could use to bring harm to myself. That's actually a pretty good instinct, and one that even has a basis in the Bible. The scripture tells us that if there are things that are causing us to sin or, or do evil to ourselves, then we need to remove ourselves from said situation. I'm, I'm, of course, paraphrasing. It would take a lot longer to explain that principle biblically. But I even understand that. But there are some problems that I do have with this bill. And there are some reasons, I think, that are perfectly legitimate to oppose it. And here they are. I'm not, again, saying that I am completely against this bill or that Anybody that doesn't oppose this bill, that wants this bill to pass is wrong, I'm just pointing out the flaws. So first of all, a slippery slope argument does make sense here. There is legitimate concern that by putting this bill into place, that it's not that much of a leap for somebody to extend the waiting period, or to extend the definition, or to extend, and this is the really big concern, the kind of people that can put your name on that no-buy list. Because what if they said, if they already have the law in place, they're saying, look, we're not having any problems with it, but really, a person that lives with that person, they would know better than that person himself if he's actually having suicidal thoughts. So, so maybe like a spouse or an adult child, maybe somebody that's actually living in the house with them, they should be able to put that person on a no-buy list. And see, then you are getting into a violation of liberty. You're getting into a violation of that person's God-given rights by another person. So I do think the slippery slope argument does have some credibility here. And this is really my main gripe with it, even more so than the one that I just brought up, because it's a concern, but it's not one that will necessarily happen. I don't think this is going to save anybody. I, I don't. I don't see a reason. I have not been given a compelling argument for how this is actually going to help people that are struggling with suicidal thoughts. And here's why. Most people that commit suicide, they don't even tell their close family members that they're having suicidal thoughts. They don't even tell their spouse, their children, their co-workers. 
a lot of times, not every time, a lot of times they don't tell anyone. And you think that they're going to take that a step further and go to somebody to tell them to put their name on a registry to be put on that no-buy list. I don't buy that. I'm not saying that it's impossible. And if it, it does happen and it saves that person's life, great. But I don't foresee that scenario coming to fruition. Maybe I'm wrong. But considering most people that do commit suicide, they don't even tell the people around them. I kind of doubt they're going to go to some complete stranger and say, look, I'm not, I don't trust myself with the ability to own a gun, so please put me on a no-buy list. And if they do, if the suicidal person does tell someone, I would, for example, if someone came to me, a buddy of mine that's also a gun enthusiast, and said, look, man, I'm having some real struggles here, and I just, I'm not sure that life's worth living anymore. If they did that, and they were serious as a heart attack, and I could tell that, that they were really having these kinds of struggles, I would take that responsibility upon myself to say, do you want me to hang on to your firearms for you? You want me to store them in my place for a while? I mean, that would be the next course of action, in my opinion. And so because of that, I, I do want to really emphasize this. I think that because that option is there, and if they do tell somebody, and they're more likely to tell somebody close to them, that that base is kind of already covered. Or it certainly should be covered. And if I were the person that were having these thoughts, I would certainly ask that person, since I don't trust myself with it, is it all right if I take my gun over to your house for a while? And that brings me to another point. It's very rare that someone actually goes out and purchases a firearm to kill themselves. Normally, they use what's around them, be that a gun or something else. It's just not a common occurrence that somebody actually goes out and makes the purchase of a firearm specifically to kill themselves. I'm not saying it never happens. I don't know what the stats are on it. I don't even know if stats exist on that. None that I could find, personally. But I don't see any reason to believe that people are going out and buying guns. And part of the thing that they actually brought up in an AL.com article that sort of brought this to my attention is that well, look at the high rates of gun crime in the state of Alabama. Or sorry, not gun crime, gun suicides. Which the point that they were making is, this is a, a big problem in our state, and by the way, it is. Not saying that they're wrong on that, but they're kind of making the point why the gun is not the issue. We don't have a ridiculously high suicide rate uh, compared to other countries. The U.S. doesn't. In fact, we're 27th. I talked about this not long ago when people were talking about gun suicides. I think it was uh, after Beto O'Rourke. We're 27th in the world, and all 26 countries have way less guns than us. All of the ones that are ahead of us. If people want to destroy their lives, as sad and tragic and horrible as that is, they use what's around them. The fact that there is not a gun in the house is not going to stop them from doing that. That's the reason you have a country like Japan with virtually no gun ownership that has a ridiculously high rate of suicide. The gun is not the problem. And that same AL.com article actually ironically kind of made that point accidentally. One of the lines in there with the person that they interviewed that had had suicidal thoughts in the past, one of the things that he brought up was, I was scared to go into the kitchen because I didn't trust myself around the knives. Yes, exactly. Because somebody that is in that mindset, they're thinking about different ways that they could go ahead and end it. And the fact that there isn't a gun in the house doesn't mean there aren't ways to kill yourself within that own house. Again, I, I'm all for helping these people as much as humanly possible. I mean, being an employee here, I've actually had to take suicide prevention classes. And so this is something that I wouldn't get anywhere close to calling myself an expert on. But I'm saying I'm all in favor of reaching out and helping people in any way that we can, including the removal of things that they might use to hurt themselves, if that's something that helps them. I'm just saying that putting yourself on a no-buy list isn't really something that's going to do that, at least not from anything that I have seen in that. 
I, I just don't see how it's going to help them. And so it's not really so much an issue of I think that it's a bad law. It's just that I don't think it's a viable law or it's, it's not a law that's actually going to help anybody or do anything productive. That's really my big issue. Because since it is self-imposed, I don't think that it's going to do that, but I also don't think it's going to do any good either. And since I don't think that it's really going to do any good, I don't want to risk the slippery slope situation that we just discussed, where people will just expand the existing law to include other people other than the person themselves. And when you look at the United States, United States ranks first in gun ownership, not even close. We are by far and away the most. In fact, it's a two-to-one ratio. The second, I think it's Sweden. I could be wrong. I'd have to look at my stats. But the second highest country, the, the country that ranks second in gun ownership, has about 60 guns per 100 people. We have 120 guns per 100 people. We have more guns than we have citizens, and that's just the ones that we know about. There's no telling how many more we have. That There's no way to really estimate how many firearms we have in our possession privately in this country. And yet we're not even close to the top when it comes to suicide rates. This is an issue with a flawed worldview, a flawed way of thinking. It's true of suicides. It's true of crimes. It's not about the object. It's not about the physical thing. You want to fix suicides, that is a noble goal, and I'll do anything I can to help you out on that. But we have to realize what this is a real problem about. What is the core issue underlying it? We have a dearth of purpose because we have abandoned God in so many ways in our society. People no longer feel as though their life means anything. And as horrible as it is to say, when you've trained somebody from their youth up to tell them that essentially you're just a meat sack riding on a rock through space and there's really no more significance to you than that, is it any wonder they feel like their life doesn't really have meaning or purpose or doesn't really matter to people? Is it any wonder that people feel like, well, really I'm just a burden and I would be better off if I weren't here. Is it any wonder that they have those feelings when they've been raised that way? Teaching people that there is an all-powerful, all-knowing God that loves them, that created him specifically for a purpose to serve on this earth. And we don't always know what it is until much later in life. But the point is that purpose is there. And that that God cares about them intimately in a way that no other being can. That's how you instill a sense of purpose in people. That's how you end the suicide crisis. If we want to address this problem, that's where we've got to start. Now, y'all know that I am a big believer in personal liberty, and that means I think that you should be free to decide for yourself whether or not you like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.